Hello, welcome to the Social Hand Grenade podcast with Joseph Wilson. Hello, I'm the Social Hand Grenade himself. I am here at the Guildhall in Southampton, south of England, a massive theatre, and I'm backstage now all set up, uh, prepared, I think, nervous, definitely, to uh, interview Jasper Carrot. Um, this is, <laughs> I don't know what to say or describe them. It, it, this, is, this is big. I'm literally sat opposite uh, the open door and maybe like some kind of presidential West Wing kind of thing. He's going to come in um, uh, in about uh, 15 minutes. Um, I'm, uh, I, I, I think I've done the research. I think I... But what do you say to a, a guy who's done everything, who is a master? I, f- um, I feel like I'm one of those, uh, you know, young men that have travelled for thousands of miles, you know, above some you know, the, the wall of China and just got there to, to meet the master. Uh, and he sat there in the throne on some mountain, uh, some temple. Uh, but he's, uh, to be as cheesy as you like, at its core, he's a temple of comedy. Uh, and, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> I don't know what to say. We'll see, we'll see where it goes. And, uh, and, and yeah, I, we're here with the Jasper Carrot um, social hand grenade podcast and uh, I definitely did not think it'd be this easy to get an interview it was, I, there's some some other comics where I'd love to have on but they they put up a bit of a fuss <laughs> and it's quite funny you got funny like Jasper Carrot going yeah I'll do it like, no this is way too easy to get access to you this is way too easy but extremely kind and I just very excited join us after whatever your next bit of music you hear for the social hand grenade podcast proudly proudly presents a genuine hero and a genuine master of the arts of comedy jasper carrot and here he is oh god hi hi how are you hi jasper thank you how are you? Jasper, Joe, Joe, Jasper. Yeah, we've met before. Yeah, we will leave you to it. We'll leave you to it. Yeah, amazing. Thank you. Well, firstly, I'm just going to put that there. Yeah, it's a bit. Are you in the way? No, it's just a bit in the eyes. Oh, okay. Should we turn some more lights on here? I know you're all right. I'll just do my diva impression. All right. Um. Yeah. Before we do the cans are there, and let's sort you out. And can we sort the mic out for you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, however you want it. Pardon. But by the way, I thank you so much. Doing this. I'm a comic. A yes, comic I know. I, re- I remember you do this uh, ra- radio thing on the internet, is it? Yeah, or? the podcast. I did it with Alistair. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's just basically the whole thing is as a comic, there's another com- like the process. Yes. So instead of the boring, hacky quest, where would you get your material from? It's like, <laughs> right, I want to know, <laughs> what, let's break apart this whole. So that's where I'm literally coming from. Okay. Um, do you want to? No, that's about that's about, that's good for me. If that's good, you 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 put it where you where where where, uh, where you right, normally just, have it. Just in case. Yeah. Okay. And I know what time you need to be out. It's all right. We're okay. We're okay. Now we've done all the stuff. Okay. So what? you far away, and we'll see what we can do. <coughs> Amazing. Okay. Uh, well, um, hello, welcome to the Social Hand Grenade Podcast uh, here in Southampton, the Guildhall um, Theatre or Monster. Let's be honest. It's it's not a thing. <laughs> It's a, it, you can you can shoot grouse in in that building out there. I can tell you, it's, it's massive. Uh, Jasper, thank you uh, once again for being on the Social Hand Grenade podcast. Um, I'm going to be honest. Fuck knows how I how I got you to sit in front of me. Not even women want to sit in front of me. Oh well. But I there know. we go. It's I your think, lucky day. I think the brown envelope with a few redies in this helped. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, first of all, thank you so much. Um, wh- right, well, uh, but as the social hand grenades about the comics process, mm-hmm. you know, and, um, it, well, I mean, you know, I'd love to talk to you about, you know, because there's so many facets of your career and just trying to research you in so many ways mm. and trying to understand. Um, but I think maybe at first, uh, what I've been interested in is really your daughter. Yep. Um, uh, she, she was uh, Dawn, she, or she, well, she played Dawn on The Office. Yep. Uh, and what I've found, a lot of people go, oh, is that... Jasper's daughter. Yeah, yeah. So what I'm interested, like, because from a guy that you've been doing like this whole like showbiz thing for since it all began, really, which I'd like to talk to you afterwards. Mm. What were your feelings that oh, like your daughter going into show business? Well, it was a no-brainer because it's a fantastic business to be in, 
Um, it's, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the highs are very high, the lows are very low, and as long as you're prepared for that. Um, and I, I didn't stop her at all. In fact, I, I, you know, I really encouraged her to get involved because it's a great business and she had talent and she has the looks. Um, and I just said, go for it. And we just made a, we, we made a, a little bit of a pact that uh, I wouldn't help her in, in respect of I wouldn't start pulling strings or anything like that. She had to do it all by herself. Uh, but obviously I would give her advice. Um, and uh, from when she first started, I didn't have to say too much. Um, she did a couple of TV things, and I, all I said was like, um, still the eyes. The eyes you know, are, portray everything, and they're too, uh, they're too busy. And you need to understand that the eyes say it all. Uh, and I was thinking, I wonder if she understands that. And then when she did The Office, my God, she does it better than me. <laughs> she, she had taken it to heart, and, the, and those looks... She didn't have to say anything. It was the looks. Because that's what the whole with her character, it was, as you say, the looks. Yeah. And that's so interesting because it was that love relationship between her and the Tim character. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> love. Now, explain that to me because that's amazing. The only thing you said to her was the looks. So what specifically are those looks you talk about? Like what, 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 should, what did you tell her to think? Well, for instance, uh, it was a couple of times when she was left bemused and she wasn't too sure what was going on. Well, she didn't have to... You, you don't have to move your head or your hands or your face or make you go, well, my God! Mm. Uh, you, just, you, just, you just conveyed the, the confusion. And you can do that with the eyes. Just, just, that, or that, <laughs> just that slant of the head. Uh, and she did it brilliantly. Um, and uh, and it, I didn't really have to t uh, say very much at all. And in fact, when, when she was doing The Office, before it all kicked off, mm. I often say, if I'd have seen a script of The Office before it all started, I would have said, Lucy, you know, give up the day job, <laughs> don't bother. Really? <laughs> yes, I, would, I never, I didn't see it at all. How amazing. Why didn't you see it? What was well, the... when I say I didn't see it, I wouldn't have seen it. I'm sure I wouldn't have seen it. But as soon as I saw the first episode, I realised what she was on about. And that's when I knew she would be fine in the business, because she saw it. And I, I was very impressed with that. I mean, well, yeah, I mean, it was a knockout performance um uh, but it's quite interesting could why i asked that were you concerned about you know your daughter going into the mm. business because it is so it, there's so many plus points as you said the highs but yeah. then the lows and the backstabbery mm. and everyone trying to shaft 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 and you know uh, you, i'm sure everyone every comic has a thing to say i suppose so that. i've never i've never felt that you know people shafting me or whatever i've just gone on and and, and i i I do what I do, and if you like it, fine. If you don't, it, it ain't going to worry me. You know, I, I've mm. got a very thick skin. In the early days, I realised you don't have to read reviews. It's one person's view. That's all it is. And if there's 10, 12 million people watching you regularly every week, well, you're doing something right, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, Michael McIntyre, he gets a lot of stick. He's just grossed 25, 30 million pounds on the tour. What's he doing wrong? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I just think it's, it's a nonsense. And I never saw that side of the business at all. And, and in fact, um, I, uh, I always encouraged, you know, particularly writers and, and comedians, I always went out and thought, you, you know, we need more people doing stand-up. Because when I came through in the late 70s, uh, <clears throat> stand-up on television really was the, was the one line of jokes with blokes uh, in black ties. And so the, the raconteuring uh, style was, was very, very new to this country. Well, that's what, I mean, that's exact. oh, you've, it's like you've read my notes before, Jasper. That's exactly what I wanted to start off with, really, was because you, uh, and I'm going to be very American and, yeah. you know, be about it. <laughs> no, we're both British people going, <laughs> oh, God, compliments. But, like, as you just said, when you start all coming up in the mid-70s, or before, like, you were from the folk scene and the rest. Mm. At the same time in British comedy, it was like the Tom O'Connors, the Bernard Mannings, the Comedians special. Yep. Like my mother-in-law. It was that type of comedy. Yep. Now, you, as to my knowledge, you weren't part of that group. You were this new wave of this, like, with the Dave Allens, the, the Billy Connollys, the, this new kind of genre that you started. You, mm. you know, I feel that you really were at the forefront of this alternative circuit, but for the alternative circuit of the comedy store in London. Hmm. I mean, how, I wanted to, because you started in the folk scene, so how did, were they rallying against you? 
No, you see... These uh, old comedians doing my mother-in-law jokes? What, no, what happened? No, there was no... Uh, and, uh, the guys that were doing that didn't know who I was. They, they'd never been in a folk club. But, of course, folk clubs had spawned this sort of um, raconteur star, as you say, Billy Conley. And I used to get him work. I used to bring him down for, for, for tours in the Midlands. And I used to start in Birmingham and on the Saturday, and on the Sunday he'd be in Plymouth, and then on the Monday he'd be back in Birmingham, Tuesday he'd be in Liverpool, Wednesday he's in Leicester, uh, and he used to put up with it. Because um, you were an agent. Just yes, I was a bit of an agent, yeah. And um, it was, we didn't realise what we were doing. You know, we didn't That's amazing. Re- yeah, we, we, we didn't see it as being um, uh, ultra-successful as it was. Uh, I, I was a very, uh, I, I was a product really of American stand-up, you know, sort of Tom Lehrer and Bill Cosby, Shelley Berman, Bob Newhart, uh, eventually George Carlin, um, and no one was doing a- anything like that in this country except perhaps, a, in a small way, blast debates. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and of course, when when I broke through, I, I more or less had television to myself because Billy couldn't do television because of the language. So I, I was out there doing it, and it suddenly, that, the, the, you know, the whole comedy thing just exploded. That must be just amazing. Like, uh, I love the fact, I love what I, that you said, like, because how are you just doing these folk clubs? Yeah. And, you, you know, just like, uh, is this right? I don't know. So, like, how did you build in these folk clubs? Because you ran one yeah. in, uh, in, in Solihull, in Solihull mm. which is next to Birmingham. Um, so you started this, but how did you break into these routines? How did you start building these American-style routines? <clears throat> well, because um, I remember there was a, a distinct watershed. I, I was at my own club, and I realized that it was no use doing one-liners because um, people had heard them. And, and, and if I was going to a folk club, say, uh, and Mike Harding had been on the week before... Um, everybody was going, well, Mike Harding does that. Yeah, we've seen him, yeah. yeah. So I had to start uh, developing a style of my own. And I always remember I had um, an experience at Butlin's Holiday Camp uh, down in Bognor Regis, and I was down there. I, I wasn't a red coat. Um, well, I was a duffel coat, and I used to <laughs> deliver the groceries. And, and uh, I got this, um, this little sort of thing, this little routine, and I remember going on stage thinking... Have I got the courage to do this? Because there was no punchline as such. And it was like, um, uh, that, you know, Bogner Regis. And I, I always remember, um, you know, the guards come round uh, midnight, every night, round all the shadows going, you know, bang, 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 bang. Oh, oh, have you got a girl in there? No, honest, there's no girl in here. Hang on, we'll get you one. And it, it, it started off that sort of, you know, and the food was yeah. great when you caught it. and. <laughs> All that sort of thing. Yeah. And, and I remember doing it, and it was really successful. And I was, I thought, that's it. That's the breakthrough. That's the, the, that was the, the watershed. And, and then I started doing personal experiences, uh, very much in the style of the Americans. Yeah. And it just grew. And, and, of course, what was great, I could go to a folk club, and no one had done this before. So how do they audiences react in the folk oh, clubs? Terrific, because that, that's how I got my reputation, and that's how I was earning my living. So, you're like in front of the other like bands or folk singers, you're doing some this new thing, yeah. like you know, talking to the crowd in between songs. Talking to the crowd. It's very important that Joe, because yeah. I wasn't talking at them, I was talking to them, which was a big difference in comedy. Oh my God! Right. Okay, my brain's about to explode. Please ex- tell me the difference. <laughs> Sorry if I come across really excitable, but I'm very excitable. This well, is when, you, if you, when you do cabaret, yeah. um, you talk at an audience because you're on the bill with the bingo, you're on the bill with the booze, you're on the bill with the food, you're on the bill with you know, people socialising and chatting, and so you've got to talk at them. And, uh, w- whereas in a folk club audience, they're sitting and they're saying, right, talk to us. You know, what, who are you and what mm. do you do? Uh, and, that's, and that's how I developed that conversational style. It was interesting, early on, you talked about Dave Allen. Dave Allen, of course, used to tell jokes. And they elongated jokes, but they were jokes. They, they, it wasn't raconteuring at all. He started to do the raconteuring in the early 80s when he realised that that's what he could do. And I, I always remember thinking, blimey, Dave, you catch on quick. Um, and, uh, and, it, and, and then, of course, it, it really took on. And like, uh, I remember talking to Alexis Sale saying like, he saw me on TV and thought, that's what I want to do. Uh, and that's how, I, you know, that's how you do it. Um, and uh, I said at the time, um, 
uh, the, the, the comedy needed expanding because it was so strictured. And now comedy what is wonderful because it's just like music. Whatever comedy you want, it's out there. I tell you, yeah, absolutely. You know, if you want it black and blue and filth, fine. If you want some, you know, social satire, it's out there. If you want reminiscing, it's out. It, every, you know, it's all catered for. So whatever you want, someone's doing it. I'm gonna. What you said about that because it's so true. What you said is that to or at yeah. to an audience. Now you that very conversational style is you know it's always uh, to the audience. Yeah. Uh, and you did like well you I I mean I saw you at the Richmond that's where I briefly met you like at the Richmond Theatre in London and I've got to say I watched it like it masterful it was just like oh. watch I, I know to you going oh shut up don't, whatever what are you talking about like but for me I go sit there going that's masterful uh, and I remember saying to you like you know as a comic you sit there about going yeah whatever mate going yeah 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 and you know we, when you watch a comic you're kind of you could tell where the punchlines might be and mm -hmm. you know you're judging and every time you completely sideswipe me because oh. I was going and that's the punchline it's not oh my god and it was even better <laughs> but what I noticed there and even on TV, but especially live, how in such a big auditorium, like such a big space, you still make it small and you talk too. How, how do you do that and not do the at, talking at the crowd? Because it's a massive... What, what device do you use to really talk to them? Well, I don't talk to an audience. I talk to an individual. Now, I don't single anybody out, but it's like talking to an individual. If you're, st if you're trying to talk to everybody, it's impossible. You can't, you can't talk to 2,000 people, 10,000 people. But what you can do is focus that audience on you. So it's a one-to-one -one with, you know, maybe a couple of people. And so that's when it becomes very intimate. And you also have to understand the power of having a, a microphone and the fact that you are dealing with people um, on a very different level to anybody else. And it's, it's something that you have to learn. It can be abused, very much so. How? Hitler. How? Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so did <laughs> Hitler abused it. Wow. That, well, yeah, OK, how he, did Hitler abuse it? Goodness well, of course, he, what he did, he's, he, he got control of people. And then he stepped it up into, into this frenzy. And, and it's possible to do. I mean, as a comedian, I'm, sometimes I'm thinking, I've got the audience, and they're just, they're just, you know, in fits. And I have to be very wary that that is a power that you need to understand, because otherwise you could start ranting about being right-wing or left-wing or whatever, and you could get those people to think the way you do. That's not what it's about. I mean, that's what, uh, that's, uh, it's very true. And as stand-up, I'm not, like, comparing my stand-up to yours, obviously, but is that, that, structure what you say how that can you can change an audience mind like and even I've on this podcast I've spoken to other comics when you see those lazy comics when they've got them at that peak in the palm of their hand and they start doing like oh look at the guy in the front row he's gay and it, it helps the audience go well if the guy on stage is saying it then yeah we should be anti whatever anti this and that um but what I what I want to ask is that when you have them there I mean who do you do you just imagine that you're talking to a person, like, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, or does it freak you out? You go, right, there's a few thousand people here in the audience. Well, um, the way I've looked at it, it's, it's far more frightening to talk to 100 people than it is to 10,000. <laughs> because if 10% of 10,000 laugh, that's a bloody big noise. 10% of 100 is 10 people, mm. and they become intimidated because they're laughing and the other 90% aren't. Yeah. Whereas if you're in 10,000 and you're laughing and there's another you know, 1,000 people laughing with you, you, do, you don't become intimidated. So no. I always felt it was a lot easier the bigger the audience in many respects. And like one of the, the thrills of doing the comedy I'm doing now is we're doing small venues. You know, we're doing 600 seats, 1,000, 1,200. And I'm going back to the old days, it, going back to the basics, eyeball to eyeball. It's, to quote, you know, Bill Shankly, I can run anywhere I like on stage, but poof, I can't hide. Yeah, because they're all there. Yeah. I mean, what, what, I mean, what I wanted to like, ask is now that you're, because you, you took a lot of time off. Yes. Uh, filming and you're doing your TVs and this and producing, that, you know, and, yeah, that yeah. thing called Who Wants to Be a What? Some, <laughs> some, some massive show. And by the way, you produced... Or were you a production company producing? I was involved with the it? production company, yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like Thank you. Anything you touch. Thank you, God. <laughs> yeah, no, honestly, Jasper, seriously. There is a God. It's just ridiculous, <laughs> yes, your career. Anyway, but, yeah. 
But what I'd ask, because then a few years ago, you came back talking mm. about paying to 10,000 to 100 people. Yeah. You came back and started doing warm up shows like at the Glee in Birmingham. Yeah. Uh, and then, so how do you prepare in the smaller clubs to build material for like the bigger rooms? Well, <coughs> what's your got, process about that? The process used to be through folk clubs, the process used to be I had an idea in my head and I would go out on the, on the, on the night and just, and just do it. And then, uh, where, you know, remember where the laughs were, and then the next time, cut out the guff and get more, you know, quicker to the punchlines and then put more in. So it was, you know, it was a bit clay upon clay, get, you finally get the model. Nowadays, I tend to write uh, much more than I used to. And then, and then take, take the writing, and then, and I can always, I, I, I know what isn't funny. I don't always know what is, far from it, but I know what isn't funny, and I know what isn't funny for me. I mean, that's why I don't use expletives, because I, I can't get laughs on effing and blind, not that I've ever tried, to be honest, but I would feel so uncomfortable doing that. And I just, and, I, and it builds, you know, um, and, you, and you keep it in, and, and that's the process. Uh, and it, um, and, and, and over, you know, you do 100 shows. Sure. It becomes, you, 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 there's, there's a saying that, You'll know the material, but you won't own it, right? Okay. And it's when you own the material, that's when you get the maximum effect. And then, because you, you're so comfortable in that routine, that, you go, yeah. I can drop the ball there, but I know I'll pick yeah. it up there. I think always get to that stage when you become a master of a routine is when you're so bored of it, but you know it's perfect. Yes. You know, you've just got, yeah. I know this routine, I could do it with my eyes shut. But to, talking of like the process, the, I would like to talk about the, the approach of the, the nut on the bus. Routine. Yeah. One of the one of your major of many, but like routines. Mm. Uh, and I would like to, to, how did that, as you probably just said, how did that come about? Literally, you saw an observation and you just built. Mm. I mean, how long did that take to become that masterpiece that it mm. is? You know, like. Yeah, probably I mean, maybe 10 shows, 15 shows, something like that. I mean, the basics were there. It was just one of those things that, you know, you, you talk through with friends and, uh, you know, saying like, oh, that woman got on the bus and she sat next to me. She always sits next to me. And you think, yeah, yeah. And of course, it's, it's not, it, she doesn't always sit next to me. She always sits next to everybody. Sure. And, of course, that's, and that's what, you know, observational comedy is about, if there's such a thing. Um, and, and you just build on little bits, you know, and add things on. And when you're doing it, you know, as a comedian, something yeah, sparks into you. And you go, oh, yes, and, boom, and get the laugh. Oh, keep Always that at in. the weirdest and inappropriate moments. Yes. You're in the bath. But, Where the f yeah. But also, I, I talk about stepping stones a lot, because when you've got a routine, you know where the laughs are. They're your stepping stones, because you know, you know, you get to one stepping stone, and you know where the next one is, and maybe you'll just divert it a little bit. Just try a little bit new stuff. If it's not working, hey, you're on to the next stepping stone. Laugh, and you're back into it with the audience again. And then there's the next stepping stone. So all the time, you're going from stones to stone and building little bits in, and then keeping what, what works and getting rid of what doesn't. So the stones become more and more, and the river becomes wider and wider, and you end up with a routine. And you learned that, um, because you, you obviously learned that through experience. experience. <laughs> because you start in the folk days, where, as you said before, it's like you're doing any old, like, well, not any old, but there were no rules. Yeah. So when was the moment where you realised this whole stepping stone, you know, process? Like how many years into it where you went, oh, okay, it has to be like this? Well, I suppose um, when I started uh, in the very early days and I was doing folk clubs, um, I, 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 I came, I, I realised that um, I wasn't as good as I thought I was. <laughs> we have you know that. what I mean? <laughs> and you... And you go, and you, but you uh, stick with it because you've got to make a living. So you stick sure. with it, and you, and you, and and then I started to realise that I was a lot better than I thought I was, um, and that and and it wasn't that I was so good. It's just that there weren't that many people who were better, right? And so that gave me that confidence then. And then it, it built. And you've got to remember, I was doing folk clubs for about six years, seven years. Yeah. I built up a load of material, three hours of material. That's when I could do, uh, that's when I did the six half hours for London Weekend Television called yeah. An Audience with Jasper Carrot. And uh, Michael Grade gave me the opportunity. And, and I did them. Uh, and it was revelatory, you know. I mean, people suddenly realised there was a new form of stand-up comedy. Yeah, yeah. especially because, as we said before, it was with the comedians, my mother-in-law yeah. and stuff. And now... And you've got to remember yeah. that in those days, comedy, stand-up comedy didn't exist after nine o'clock. 
No, it, yeah. and also it's like that. It wasn't like in America. It was big over the boom. Mm, yeah, and we didn't really have a boom sort of no. thing. What I would like to ask because I, for me, I really feel that you're one of the main guys with like Alan and Connolly and. I mean, it's so many, if you don't mind. For no. me, it's like the, you are the start of this alternative push. Mm-hmm. Now, when they say alternative comedy in Britain, we, they were always associated in 1979 uh, at the Comedy Store in London. Yeah. Like Alexi Sales, you said, Ben Elton. But you were never part of that. No. Why? Because you, it seemed to my mind, you were like one of the main guys who would be part of that. No? Well, it was. I always, I, I was, ne- I was never in the, the 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 bow tie league, and I was never in the alternative league. I was reason. I was quite a bit older than than most of the others, um, and I, I I I never moved from Birmingham. I you know my home was in Birmingham, and I never mixed in the in the London scene. I was never at the comedy store. I was never at you know um, with Ben or with with, with uh, Alexi, and and I I, I ploughed my own furrow. And I always have. I've never really been part of anything. Uh, you know, I'm not really accepted by the bow tie comics. I'm not really accepted by the alternatives. I'm not really accepted by, by anybody except the people who like what I do. I mean, that must be quite refreshing to, because you could see there were the negatives about that. You're not accepted, you know, because it's nice hanging out with comics. You know, it's a great, because everyone's got that kind of instinctual, you know where everyone's coming from. But that must have been great where you go, all right, you don't want to hang out with me, guys, you different sets of groups. I'll do my own thing. But isn't it important comedy to make your own thing? I think so. But did you have a lot of pressures from TV going, Jasper, can we, for your specials, can you do a bit more mother-in-law jokes? or no, what was your? never had that at all, no. Um, I, I, again, I ploughed my own way, you know. Uh, once I'd done, uh, I'd done a couple of specials for ITV, um, I, did, uh, I did an hour's live comedy, uh, 9 to 10 o'clock on, on major TV, on ITV. And uh, that, I, that had never been done before, and I don't think it's been done since. Um, and once I'd done that, then I, then I, I was in a sort of um, uh, a hiatus, a quandary. I didn't really know where to go. And then out of the blue, uh, the BBC came to see me. It was... T- um, um, oh, cracky. Hang on. Oh. Jim Pryor. Sorry, I'll start again. And then out of the blue, uh, Jim Pryor of the BBC came to see me. Jim Moyer. Uh, the BBC came to see him and said, would I like to work for the BBC? And I said, well, yeah, OK, let's, uh, change is as good as the rest. He said, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know. And he put me in touch with a writer called Neil Shan, who'd work with you know, a lot of people, particularly yeah. Spike Millingham. And while I was talking to Neil Shand, Jim came back on and he said, we want to do a, lo- uh, um, we wanted to do a, a satirical show on a Saturday night, and uh, Dave Allen has turned it down. He said, would you be interested? And I thought, wow, blimey. That was a massive shift for me. You know, it would be yeah. working with other writers, which I'd never really done, working with a, with a cast. Uh, and of course, it was very exciting. And, so, and, I, and I said, can we do it live? And they went, yeah. I mean, and so we did uh, Carrots Live, which, uh, again, was... Um, you know, broke a lot of barriers, won a BAFTA and stuff. And yeah, I mean, that, okay, so are they, that bleeds in, we've got, Steve's, yeah, right. okay. Um, ble- that bleeds into, um, uh, about talking about TV, so you started, yeah, and I love it, the fact that, again, from the folk days, no, you know, on TV, no one really knows what they do, because it's such a new adventure. Mm-hmm. Now, when you watch TV on, you know, TV, it's so regimental, mm-hmm. and it's really, has to be clean cut, everything, and they cut everything out, do you, do you find when you do TV now that executives say, you know, you have to make it cleaner or something? Or because you're mm. Jasper Carrot, you have the keys to the city? No, I think um, um, I, I won't do TV again, I'm pretty sure about that. Uh, Why is that? <clears throat> I can't do what I want to do. I say on stage years ago, I could talk about anything I wanted to as long as I didn't swear. Now, you can't talk about anything, but you, you, know, you have to have Tourette's syndrome to be a comedian. <laughs> and and uh, I pitched a show uh, about three years ago, two and a half, three years ago, to the BBC. Uh, and they haven't the faintest idea really what I was on about. And the show, you can, you can see this show now, and it's called Last Week Tonight. Yes. With John Oliver. That's the show that I pitched in not exactly the same show, but that's the sort of show I pitched to the BBC. Like but a I wanted satirical to do, show. Yeah, to do that. Um, and uh, to name names and stuff. But 
Um, they saw me, I think they saw me as like, you know, 8.30 on a Saturday night. Do you go, because I've read that you did a thing in 2012, you had yeah. a, your own show. They're called The One Jasper. Yeah. That's it, The One Jasper. Mm. And I noticed that you were getting a bit darker. There were certain mm. jokes where you, because it's within the whole, you know, very happy go like, you know, Jasper, you know, mm-hmm. style and... But then you had li- you have license to then just throw in these mm. darker tones. How is that more of a thing? You as you know as you're getting uh, as you get more experience in your career because like you know kind of grand master mm. kind of you can get darker. I suppose so. I don't at the moment because I I'm out there enjoying myself. Just I'm just doing whatever I want to do. Um, uh, as you know, as a comedian, you can't make people laugh for two and a half hours solid. It's impossible. What you have to do is to bring them up and bring them down with comedy. That was the art of concert comedy, is how do you bring an audience down with laughter? That was very difficult. You have to keep them interested and you keep them chuckling and then you build them back up. But of course, as you know, you know if, you, if you, you've got, you know, your sides are splitting, it's very, very difficult to come back. I mean, Ken Dodd, is, you, you look at Ken, he loses the audience completely. <laughs> And then he brings them back, you know, when they've had a chance to breathe. Well, doing the show I'm doing at the moment, of course, I've got music to break it up. So I do half an hour of comedy to kick off the show. It's right down your throat. You know, I can be, I can, you know, I can, I can do, you know, 25, 30 minutes of hysterical comedy where yeah. people are absolutely clutching the sides. And it's, thank you very much, here's the music. So and how do you follow music? Because they say that you should never, as a comic, follow music. Ah, nonsense. I love it, I love nonsense. it. It's just you can do whatever you want. Uh, I mean, we've got a great show out there at the moment. It's called Stand Up and Rock. Yeah. And um, the, the, the audiences love uh, the, the sort of variety of it. They go and they get the comedy and they have a really good laugh and then they hear this terrific music. My audience particularly, that's sort of 45 plus, so they get all the songs from, you know, 60s but 70s and 80s. They know the classics, they know the words, brilliant musicians. And then I come back in the second half, I do another half an hour, down your throat, and then I get off and then the music comes back on and then I, I, I get involved with the music as well. Um, and it's... it's uh, it's great because I don't have the responsibility of the whole evening on my own shoulders, and that's a great relief. And it gives me a it gives me a license, really, just to go out and enjoy it myself. I'm doing the comedy that I like and that I find funny. You know, I find John Oliver very funny. I love that. I love Brilliant. what he does. Love what he does. Uh, and I can go out with the audience and just just be funny for the sake of being funny. I haven't got anything to push. Um, I'm to, I'm thinking about doing. Shall I do something about you know? Jeremy you have, Corbyn. You have freedom, but now yeah. after what? How long has your career been? Forty-five 40? years. I mean, you're at stage now, as you've always said. I don't care. I'm going to do my own thing, mm-hmm. which is so hard to do when you get caught up because you need to get paid sometimes. Yeah. You have to tow the company line sometimes. But I love that, and also you've got to that stage where I don't care. You know that, yeah. and that actually you're probably funnier. One is probably funnier when you just I'm doing this for me. Mm. And in a way, I am. I'm, I'm having the time of my life, and I don't have to worry about the money. Because uh, I don't need it, to, to be absolutely honest. And that's know? not a gross thing for you to say. It mm. is one of those when you do clubs, you have to worry about the money because that's how you're getting paid. <laughs> that's, you know, yeah. I mean, you know, coming through, you, it, it's your it's your business. And you know, and people say, what what what's the spur to write new comedy? It's 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 money. You know, it's my career. I, I, I want to keep doing this job. So in the I had to write new material because I was going back, you know, in, in three, three years, four years, going back to the same venues, and you had to have pretty much the same, uh, the, pretty much different material. And that was the spur, you know. And as you know, um, fear is a fantastic um, creative force. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you don't want to go out there and die on your ass because once you've died on your ass, you know how painful it is. And I always said, you know, uh, for a, a male comedian to die in his eyes, it's the nearest you are ever going to get to the pain of childbirth. <laughs> and it's... <laughs> the shame, the regret. Oh, God, I mean, we've, we've all, <laughs> all died deaths, and they are horrible things. Could you, you deal with that now? I know we have to wrap up, and Steve's going to come in and start telling me off. Yeah. But, I mean, and I know you need to do your show. I've got one minute, and I would just like to ask, do you, this whole, does it happen in your league, in your realm because you're the higher echelons of, you know, does it happen? You die no. on your ass? No. No. I mean, I remember... It must be a great thing going, I know I'm not going to die on my ass. This is great. <laughs> uh, I, I did the Glee Club. I remember doing the Glee Club, working some new material. And, um, and, and, I, and I did it. And uh, the audience were, it was really good. Great reaction. Yeah. And I went off. And I was talking to the guy that run the Glee Club. And I went, that wasn't very good, was it? And he went, no, it wasn't. 
Phew, went down well. <laughs> Blimey, I've got this made now. I've, got, I've cracked comedy, you know. Yeah. I can do crap material and, and get a reaction. But it taught me a lesson that, uh, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't want to be... I don't want to do iffy material but get away with because of who I am or whatever, you know. And, you, um, what you want as a comic, you're laughing yeah. at the jokes, not yeah. the fact. Because, you know, with the Eddie Izzard said, when he go, he's so well known, he goes on stage, he goes, so, ooh. Mm. And they go, ah, that's yeah, what he yeah, does. Yeah, yeah. So that's so refreshing here, even at your status, even at 45 years, and you're still going, no, no, I want you to laugh at yes. these guys. Yeah. Just, it's great. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, Jasper, you need to go and do your show. Um, thank you so much for being on Social Hand Grenade Podcast. Pleasure, This Jeff. is a, thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you, um, Jasper. Yeah, thanks. Wh- uh, where's the envelope? Uh, the, <laughs> yeah, the brown one. I'll go to the The bank. Wismis, the Wismis, the Nelsons. Yeah, I'm off to the back now. Thank you so much indeed, Jasper. Cheers. Thanks, Thank Joe. You. Thank you so much. Pleasure, my friend. That was, that was, oh, uh, there you go. thanks. Oh, 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 oh. Would it? And there you have it, folks. That was uh, my end uh, of the Jasper Caribbean. He's just left. Um, I, I, I know I probably sound like an overexcited monkey. Um, it was just quite incredible. What, and what he was saying, there's certain things where I didn't even know about comedy, like the two or the at the audience and just sort uh, and I love the fact he's he was so like yeah I just do what I want you know and that is an amazing freedom uh, he have and I I thought it was amazing I hope you get something from this I'm so off my face right now with excitement uh, and uh, yeah thanks to the whole tour and you know it's with he's doing it with the, uh, the he's from ELO and I heard them downstairs just you know with their um, before the gig their warm up and I uh, just got uh, an access all areas bit, which is pretty, pretty cool. Folks, um, we have, for a competition, we have signed uh, Jasper Carrot, uh, an audience with Jasper Carrot, as he just mentioned in this podcast. Uh, if you want to win this signed copy of Jasper Carrot, I can't believe I'm actually giving this away. Um, uh, Google um, uh, Social Hand Grenade Podcast and send me an email uh, Joseph Wilson comedian at gmail.com Joseph Wilson comedian at gmail.com uh, and uh, send in what your social hand grenade moment is like one of your social faux pas that you've made or just some embarrassing moment at Joseph Wilson comedian uh, at gmail.com uh, and the best one or Whatever, it could be anything. It doesn't have to be funny. It could be whatever. Uh, we'll win this signed copy of the Jasper Carrot and audience with, uh, and I'll post it to you, and then you can win that. Um, thank you so much for listening to this and all the other episodes. Um, sign, rate, review on iTunes, SoundCloud, we're on uh, all the other ones, Stitcher, Podbean, and uh, just rate and review. And thank you so much for listening. Uh, I'm going to stop talking because I'm off my face uh, of excitement thank you for listening <laughs> and go to josephwilsoncomedian.com rate and, review us, rate and review us on iTunes thank you and um, 